is that you have for us today. God, I'm just thankful to be a part of your family. Thankful to be adopted a son of God. Thankful to be a child. And God, I'm thankful to have these brothers and sisters. So grow us today. Expand us today. Teach us today and reach us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Be seated if you would. I know today we've been told many people joining online, they're out of town and traveling, so we welcome you to the service this morning. You know, we're going to talk about something today, church, that I think is very, very important to your spiritual walk, and it is a way to see how far you've progressed and how much you're spiritually growing. Listen, um, I, I, I want to challenge you, okay? Don't be a person that is content where you are in your faith. And don't be a person that gets content with the knowledge of God that you possess today. Go further, go deeper, go farther with God than you've ever gone. Make it a determination of your life that you're going to continue growing and you're going to continue going in Jesus' name. So I'm going to take you to a passage in Hebrews chapter 6. Will you go there with me? Hebrews chapter number 6. And let's let's take our text there. Um, Verse number 1 is where we'll start today. And, And we're just going to read a few verses. Now, I hope today that you're ready to go on a renewed journey with us as a church and and, and in our spiritual walk. Um, Here we are. We're at a new season. You know, in the year of Jubilee, if you know anything about the Bible in the seventh year, slaves were set free, debts were removed, and and, and it was like a, a fresh beginning. And as of Monday this past week, in our year of Jubilee, seventh year of ministry, all debts have been removed from Grace Community Church. And people are now being set free like never before. We've had opportunities. How many of you have seen Christ do a major work in your life over the last few months, last few years in ministry? Okay, now here's the deal. I believe God now has opened this community and opened our family to go deeper and to take the gospel deeper than we've ever taken it before. Uh, Last night I had the privilege of speaking at a fundraising banquet for the Philippines Missions, um, JPA, that, that we go with and, and be praying. And, and I'm going to just put this out there. If you're interested in missions in November, we're going to start our missions development team in our life groups at six o'clock. And we want you to be a part of that. We are already lining up next year, three trips that we will be going on to Jamaica, Romania, and to the Philippines. Our hearts are being pulled in two different areas and we don't know when we're going, but at some point we're looking to go to Nepal and another point, Uganda, all right? And so God is expanding and if you want to be a part of that, I'm going to say this, Uh, we've said it so many times, if the light is going to shine far and bright from the home, then it needs to shine the brightest in the home. And here we are, and I'm, I'm going to say, don't feel like you're going to be effective in world missions if you're not effective in local missions today. If you're not getting plugged in and diving into the opportunities like 180 Youth or Mobile Life House or these uh, these ministries that are going into the community and reaching. And so I want you to be praying towards that. Why? Because you are growing when you start going. And in here, if you are not doing something in service for the Lord, you're not actively sharing God, then there's a good chance that you are spiritually unhealthy this morning. There's a good chance that you're spiritually stagnant, and there's a good chance that you're struggling. You're not where you need to be. God did not call you to be idle. We say it all the time, when I am idle is when I build my idols. God called us to go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Then it told us to teach them and train them and raise them up. So I challenge you, this is the new generation. This is where we want to go. We want to be the Hebrews type of church. And in Hebrews 6, it says, so let's stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Listen, God's grace is real. Do you believe that today? God's love is never ending. Anybody believe that today? Hey, God God is a wonderful, all-powerful, miraculous God. Anybody believe that today? All right, now understand this. The Bible says, let's, let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding." He said, surely we don't need to start again with the fundamentals, all right, Uh, fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. He's saying, hey, when, when, church, at some point, when are we just going to grab that we need to stay in the right standing with God and that God forgives sin so that we stop having to repeat to believers again and again and again the things that they should grab hold to and stand firm on. All right, listen, a lot of our churches today across this nation are preaching the same messages on repeat. All we get 
is you can be saved and God will make your life and God loves you. Now, I'm going to tell you this now. If you've been a child of God for any length of time and you still don't know that God loves you, then you're messed up in the way you live in. Are you with me? I mean, listen, it's God's love that constrains us. You can't walk with God and not feel his love. I mean, you shouldn't come into the house of God without being embraced with his love. And I'm going to tell you this today. We need to stop reminding the church that they're loved and say, hey, wake up and embrace the love. And now go share the love. Go walk in the love. Go be loved. All right. And the writer here is saying, hey, we've got to stop repeating again and again and again these same messages. Let's grow some. Let's do something. Let's stop talking about getting out of debt and let's start preaching on how to get out of debt. Let's stop talking about being right with God and let's start teaching righteousness of God. Let's stop talking about these same things again and again and let's start doing them so we can move on. So that we can get deeper. Look at verse number two, if you would. It says this. He says, um, you don't need further instructions about baptism or the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, or eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. I was reading that the other day in my devotions, and I heard God calling me as a pastor to say, take them further. Take them further. Grow, grow, grow. So I'm going to show you signs of how we know if we're growing. Number one, how do you know something's growing? Uh, Write it down. It's healthy. Health is a sign of growth, and growth is a sign of health. If you're healthy, you're growing, and if you're growing, you're healthy. If you're not growing, then you're not healthy. How many of you understand this? All right, now understand, and let's look at this, if you would, from a baby perspective. In a baby perspective, at some point, we, 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 we get older, and as we get older, we get healthier and stronger. Have you learned this, that if you have a newborn baby, the worst thing you could do in the first couple weeks of that baby's life is take them out in public. The worst thing you can do is to bring them into a crowd, especially in what we call flu season. How many of you smell it? It's in the air. Flu season is coming. All right, and if you have an infant, it's unwise to bring that infant in a crowd. Why? Because that infant has not developed a healthy immune system. That infant will catch anything and everything around it, minus God's grace and protection keeping it from them. Now understand this. In, in, in life, as you grow and become exposed more to the disease and the sickness around you, your immunities get stronger. And, and things that used to make you sick no longer make you sick. You know, they say once you get the chicken pox, you never get them again. Why is that? Because your immune system builds a wall of defense around it. Now, can it repeat in rare occasions? But your immune system stands up against it. Hey, now listen, understand this. That as I develop spiritually, I should become spiritually immune to things that I wasn't spiritually strong against when I was a young believer. In other words, I should not still get hung up on the same temptations. The stronger and healthier I grow the easier to fight off the temptations in my life. We learn that, hey, every temptation that you and I have been tempted with, somebody else has already been tempted with. So matter of fact, I learn from the mistakes of others or I learn from my own mistakes, but I learn this. I don't put my temptations on repeat and I don't allow my sins to be on, 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 on repeat. Hey, listen, I may sin, but I am not sin sick. All right? In other words, I may mess up and I may stumble, but it doesn't mean that I get into that lifestyle and accept that as my reality. Hey, I may have that moment to where I get tempted and I, I fall short, but that should not become my identity. It should not become my lifestyle. And as I get healthier and as I grow, I get stronger spiritually so that I can stand against darts that used to hit. That I have faith enough to take down mountains that I used to run from. To stand in front of giants that used to scare me. To speak to life instead of speaking death. Listen, if you're growing, you're getting healthier as a Christian. But if you're stuck today in the same sins that you've been stuck in for years, you are not growing today. You're not healthy. See, hey, listen, God did not call you to be in a lifestyle of addiction. God called you to be in a lifestyle of deliverance, redemption. All right, so I may make a mess, but I'm not going to be messed up. 
I may make a mess from time to time, but I'm not going to be messed up. Why? Because as I grow, I get healthier. So let me ask you this today. Examine your life. Just pause for a moment. Are you fighting the same battles this time, this year, that you were fighting this time last year? And if so, let's make next year a growth season instead of getting stuck and complacent. Are you struggling with the same worries that you've always struggled with? Or are you standing against worry in the name of Jesus Christ? We talked on this Wednesday, and maybe you need to uh, go listen to it. Um, so coming from the, the story of when the apostles are watching, walking down the street, and the, this demon-possessed sorcerer girl gets behind them and mocks them for days upon days, the Bible says. And then finally, Paul, exasperated, exhausted, and tired of hearing her speak, turns around and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And the Bible said, immediately the demon left. And so we came to this conclusion, how long are you going to let the demon talk before you speak up? How long are you going to let that demon ride you and that worry be in your life before eventually you get sick of it and turn around and say, in Jesus' name, get out. In Jesus' name, no longer, no more. Hey, we got too many demons talking. We need the Spirit of God talking. Too many people listening to the voice of the enemy instead of listening to the voice of God. Too many people whose immune system spiritually is down and diseased and instead of letting the Holy Spirit come in their lives. Hey, there's one of these verses that says, stand firm in the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to circle both of those and listen. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no stand. But because of the Holy Spirit, you can stand against anything. Why? He makes you healthy. He makes you clean. Now look at this, number two. If I, if I am growing, not only am I getting healthier, but I'm also developing an appetite. All right, now how many of you uh, understand this process? You know, when you were a baby, and I, I've said this before, so let's make it quick. When you were a baby, your parents introduced you to formula. All right, and you would wake up in the middle of the night. If you've got babies, you understand this. If you don't have babies, get ready. All right, in the middle of the night, you wake up screaming and crying every two, three hours. Why? You want milk. You want formula. And then all of a sudden, your gums start to develop, and you get a little stronger, and we realize that the formula can only take you so far, so we start busting open Gerber. And we take these little spoonfuls of carrots and, and smashed peas, and we start feeding them to you, and then you realize that you like the food more than the formula. And the next thing you know, the bottles start weaning, and the food pureed starts coming in. And then one day, an aunt or an uncle, because God knows it wasn't your parents, dips their finger in chocolate and puts it on your lips. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, there's legal crack. <laughs> and you come alive in your immune system. Yeah, I mean, you're, you just start firing on all cylinders. And in that moment, you go from eyes kind of open and alert to eyes wide open. And then somebody comes in once you get a couple of treat, uh, teeth and they introduce you to a hamburger and no more do you want the formula and no more do you want the Gerber. Now why? Because you're on the milkshakes and McDonald's and the, the French fries and, and now you don't want to go back. And then as you grow, you get the whole hamburger and then you, you start getting steak and you start getting mashed potatoes and you start getting actual cooked vegetables and you realize I don't want to eat baby food anymore. And then next thing you know, somebody brings you into a buffet and, and and you're at the age of eight or nine realizing that Golden Corral has everything. And you sit there and you look at it. And you go to the little chocolate fountain and put your own little marshmallow in. What happens? Your appetite grows. The more you get exposed to, the more you desire. And the more you want. I'll never forget when Lincoln took his first drink out of a soda can. All right? Now, no soda can is safe in his presence. You set it down, he's running to it. Why? Because there's a little bit of carbonation, a little bit of sugar, and a little bit of a rush. And now he will take it, and it doesn't matter if it's pouring all over him, and he's only getting a drop at a time. He will chug that soda can. Why? He got a taste of it, and his appetite grew. And if you're spiritually healthy, you've got a taste of God, and you just want more. You got a taste of God, and now you're hungry for him. And, and, and you experienced a little bit of God and saw a little bit of the Spirit. And now you want all of God and all of the Spirit. And you're not happy with the milk of the Word. You want something to grow. Hey, listen, we want to be a church that's growing believers, not a church that's babysitting believers. So we're popping the bottle out of your mouth, and we're going to shove some steak in there, and we're going to say, hey, taste the Lord and see how good he is. 
All right, now look at this. Look at this verse, if you would. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Please underline that. Most people live their entire life and never fully experience their salvation. Their salvation in their mind is a ticket into heaven, but that is not what salvation was for. Salvation was to give you an identity on this earth that doesn't belong on this earth, to make you an ambassador of heaven with the full power of heaven and authority of heaven in a world of which you don't belong. To be able to see things and do things that the world cannot understand. Who can know God's spirit except for his spirit? And if someone doesn't have God's spirit, they do not understand his ways. And today the Bible says this, that you and I as children of God, we're to do great things, even greater things than Jesus did in his life. And he's saying, hey, we want you to crave pure spiritual milk. Why? So that you can experience the the full experience of what God intended for you to have in salvation. In other words, it's like this. God intended the world to be eaten to where there was fellowship, walk with God, and power of God, and eternal life through God. And Satan perverted it. And so instead of God waiting till you get to heaven to give you experience of Eden, God says, let me bring Eden down and place it in your heart so that in a world where I can't be, I can live through you in a vessel that's shining the light. And so God says, hey, let me help you experience what salvation actually is. It says, cry out for this nourishment. Verse number three, now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Anybody in here say, all right, I'm not being greedy, but God, I want more. I want more. Anybody in here saying, you know, I, I, I want a little more worship in my life and not worship of things and not worship of myself and not worship of material, but the worship of you, God. I want to experience a little more power. Anybody else say, hey, I want a little more presence of God in my walk. Anybody saying, hey, I want a little more authority of God in my lips and in my actions. Hey, I want the freedom of God. I don't want to be recovering. I want to be delivered in Jesus name. All right. Are you with me today? All right. So look at this, number three. All right, so not only do I get health and appetite, but I get mobility. If I'm growing, I become more mobile. I wrote down a little process, and it may be a little bit wrong here and there. We go from laying on our backs to rolling over. Rolling over to sitting up. Sitting up to crawling, crawling to walking, walking to running, and then running to driving. Am I right? We're always looking for a way from an infant child to become more mobile. And as we become more mobile, we can go further. A baby in its infancy doesn't go very far. You lay it down, it stays there. A baby, once it rolls over, sits up and realizes it's got some uh, power in it, it starts to crawl. Then it starts to pull up, and then it starts taking its steps. The next thing you know, that baby realizes, hey, I'm not confined to my bedroom, and I'm not confined to this room. Now the whole house is mine. And that baby begins to go, and then it grows into a teenager, and that teenager starts saying, I want the car keys. And then once they get that car keys, how many of you parents are with me? It's hard to keep them home. I mean, they're willing. You say, I need milk, they're in the car. Right? You, 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 10 o'clock, you want a blizzard from Dairy Queen? They're your chauffeur. Then all of a sudden they get 16, they get their driver's license, and what do they want? They want you out of the car, right? They want to get their friends in the car, and they want to get their girlfriend and boyfriend in the car, and then they want to go. And the further they get, the further they go. I'll never forget, the first time my wife came down to go on a date with me, we're driving down the road, she's from Illinois, I look at her and I said, what did your parents think about you driving all the way to Tennessee? And I was met with a look of silence, and, 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 and in there, I knew immediately she didn't tell him. Now listen, I was smart enough to know that her mama was going to hate me if she found out. So in that moment, I looked at her and said, what's your parents' phone number? She gave me her phone number. I dialed it. And Nathan, little Nathan, seventh grade Nathan, chubby, all right, curly hair, all right, sit and answers the phone. Hello? Hey, is your parents home? No. And I don't I think I told Nathan. And like, hey, I was just calling to tell him this is Josh. And I wanted them to know that Jordan came down. She's in Tennessee to see me. And so I made sure that they knew. Why? Because she went a great distance. And any mom or dad worth their salt is terrified of their children traveling. And I wanted her mom to like me. <laughs> right? 
And so I was like, we got to let this girl know that her daughter is 530 miles away. And so we let her know through Nathan, probably not the best method, <laughs> but we let her know. I'll never forget my first trip to Illinois. I drive in there, and listen, I, I at that point had parents, they, they really didn't care, so I, I didn't have anything. So I show up, I get there, I leave after I'm done preaching one night, and, and, and I get there about 3 a.m. in the morning. So they open the door, they let me in, they show me where I'm going to sleep. Not many words, if any, were spoken by the family. And if, you, if you've ever done this, any, any guys in the house today lived in a moment of total terror of what the parents of the girl you love is going to think about you? Anybody know? So the next morning I wake up to her mom making pancakes. That's a good sign. I sit down at the table. Her mom walks in, puts a couple pancakes on my, on my plate. And before she said hi, and before she said, I'm Deb, she said, I want you to know something. I was like, oh. <laughs> She said two things. My daughter will finish school, and I don't like her driving to Tennessee alone. Turned around and walked out of the room. I was like, oh, man, this is scary. But you know what? Her daughter had an independence. Her daughter had grown. It's no longer teenage Jordan living in the house. It's Jordan who already lived in another city, capable of making decisions, yes, still needing to honor and respect the family, but now the ability and the authority to go to places she's never been before. Now listen to me. God wants us as children of God to get mobile. Not to stay in, in our churches. And listen, we will fail you, totally fail you, if all we ever do is ask you to come here. If all we're ever doing is trying to get you in this place, we have messed up. All right, if all we're ever doing is trying to get you to do service for Grace Community Church... We have failed you. Matter of fact, beware. We're trying to set ourselves up to be the God of your life. If all we're about is you belonging here, you're in messed up trouble. You don't belong here. You belong in heaven. And while you're here, God gave us a family and a little battalion that we can come together, grow together, reason together, and get out together. And you know what? Hey, listen, God wants you and I to get more mobile. And the more mobile we become, the more growth that's in our life, the more independent of others. Hey, listen, I don't need you to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I can do that on my own. I don't need a crowd. I don't need an audience. I don't need that. I can proclaim Jesus anywhere. Now, it's so much greater if two go together. It's so much greater to have an army around you. Uh, last night, as I sp spoke, first time ever speaking at a fundraiser banquet, I was terrified. But you know what really gave me peace? Table 13 and table uh, 14 at that place full of Grace Community people that I knew. And I, I'm I, my wife coming up to me, wrapping her arms around me, praying on my shoulder as before we went, laying her hands on me, saying, you were made for this. Hey, listen, there's something of encouragement. But when you step up and you take the mic, it's not up to anybody else. It's up to what you know and what the Holy Spirit has given you. And I'm going to tell you this today. You do not have to bring somebody to church for them to hear the gospel. They should be able to hear the gospel through you as you're going out in the world. I know a lot of churches that say, bring them here and we'll tell them. I'm saying, no! Learn how to tell them yourself and get out there and tell them about Jesus Christ. Man, let's get some small groups in your house. Let's get some service in your step. Let's get you out there. Let's get you mobile. Why? Because mobility is a sign of health. And if you don't have mobility, you're not healthy. One of our teenage girls is on crutches today because of a hamstring injury. So I'm talking to her before service, and she's telling me what's going on. I said, sounds like you don't need to be dancing for a little bit. She's like, yeah, I can't right now. Why? Because you're in danger of, 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 of further injury. You know what that means? That, that she's unhealthy in an area of her life, and she needs healing. And if you are idle, it shows that there's, a, there's something there. That's keeping you unhealthy spiritually. If you're sitting on your couch just because you want to and you're too lazy to get out and to go worship somewhere, you're unhealthy. You know, people say, well, I can, I can have a relationship with God without the church. Yes, you can, but it's not effective. How effective are you sitting at your home? Matter of fact, I want you to do this. Next time you're alone on your couch, carry on a conversation. See how many people get reached. Go out there and make dinner for somebody and set it on your couch and sit down beside dinner and eat dinner. And then at the end of your dinner, look over at the plate beside you and see how many bites have been taken. 
You don't feed the hungry when you're by yourself. And you don't reach the lost when you're by yourself. You are not called to sit idle. And the Bible says, believers, listen to me, that you and I need to avoid idle believers. Why? Because they are contagious and they will bring you down. Hey, let's get out of this mindset that God called us to sit and keep it to ourselves. And let's realize that the more we go, the more we grow, the further we go. Saying, okay, God. You've got me on my feet. You've established my going. Now give me the keys. You're saying, oh, you want God to hold the keys. Really? Because I think God's wanting to trust you with them. Well, Jesus is the pilot and I'm the co-pilot. If that were true, then you would find that Jesus is a good enough pilot to put you behind the wheel. You say, what? No, no, Jesus didn't intend for you to just sit down and say, well, I'm just waiting on Jesus. You know, Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah, that's when you're messing up. But God did not intend. God did not intend for you to sit down and do nothing. God intended for you to get in the core of your faith and drive. You're saying, well, well, I don't believe that. I believe Jesus should be my pilot. Okay, well, let me, let me say this. If Jesus was your pilot, why aren't you going anywhere? If Jesus is your pilot, you're going, you're ready. If he looks over and you're in the airplane and he's saying, hey, you got your, you got your parachute on? Yep, jump, you're out the door. You're saying, well, I, I got to figure it out. I'm just waiting to see what God's going to tell me. I just, I need a crowd. I need an audience. I need, I need peace and I need, no, 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 no. What you're looking for is somebody to set you on a pedestal. And I'm going to tell you now, the moment you get on the pedestal is the moment you're going to fall, all right? There's going to be some great destruction in that. And I'm telling you now, I, there's a lot of things God's called me to do in my life that I am not comfortable doing. There, most things, all things that God calls me to do. It doesn't make sense. I don't feel worthy, and it scares me to death. You say, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Exactly. Satan starts attacking it, and that's how I know God's in it. You know, I, I, listen, I could have I thrown up. I, could, I told my wife, I feel like I'm going to explode. I feel like at any moment, my stomach's just going to bomb out. She's like, you're going to be fine. No, listen, in that moment, it's like, hey, God, I can't do this without you. But because of you, I'll do it. I, I, man, I, I'm not comfortable standing on this stage in front of you today. I'm not comfortable giving you a message. I look around and some of you are so much spiritually more equipped in my mind than, than I am. And some of you are much longer. Some of you, when you speak, I get intimidated because I realize how much you're growing and how much you're seeking. And I look at that and I say to myself, that does not need to stop me. That needs me to keep going and keep preaching and keep teaching. Why? Because God has set too long waiting on the church. And the church needs to come alive and say, okay, let's get the keys to this life. The Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the salvation that he's given. And let's go for a drive and let's take the gospel as far as we can go. Yesterday, we went to an autism event. Um, Delta put on an event that it means, it means the world to us, um, to where autistic parents uh, and autistic adults and children were invited to the Knoxville airport to board a plane as if they were flying. So you had to go, stand in line, go to the ticket counter, check in a bag. You went through security, TSA, you went through all of it. You went and you stood in line and waited to board the plane. Then they put you on a plane, they taxied us down the runway, took us out to a parking lot, sat us there, and revved the engines and said, well, in 35 minutes, arrive in Knoxville. And then they came by and they served us like they would do on a flight. What they were doing was saying, let us introduce your children who are sensory scared and overwhelmed to what it is like to fly so that they can become more comfortable. So here we are in a packed out airplane, sitting on the runway going nowhere. And they, they came on the intercom. Oh, we're about to begin our descent. In 15 minutes, we'll be, everything was as if you were flying. Now, I'm going to speak two things. Number one, that event meant the world. I told Jordan, I was like, I get so embarrassed coming to these. I get so emotional. Every time I thought about it, I mean, Delta paid their stewardess, paid their pilots. I mean, they paid everybody to come. It was the real deal. And as I realized how much people loved my son, my heart started exploding. But then my heart started thinking, how much more fun would it be to get in the air? So at Jordan, at Jordan and Lincoln, after we got off, Lincoln took her to the bathroom he needed to go. And so uh, she was changing his diaper. And I was standing there. And one of the ladies that was in charge of the event said, Del next year, Delta's talking about actually taking off and circling. And immediately my heart started expanding. Hey, listen, it was fun, but it's a whole lot more fun when the G-force puts you to the back of the seat. Am I right? 
and you start flying, the next thing you know, you get that adrenaline, and I don't care who you are. You can be a stranger. You can be a child. I don't care who you are. If you get the seat next to me, we're holding hands. <laughs> I mean, that is it. You say, how do you minister to somebody? You look over at them before you take off and say, do you know Jesus? Okay. Because Jesus loves us. Do you love people like Jesus? Yeah. All right, good. Then love me in a moment when I grab your hand and we take off here. All right. This isn't awkward. I'm, I'm doing this for you because I can tell you're anxious. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, listen. Listen to me. Listen to me. You know what Delta did yesterday? They went mobile. So that people that often get overlooked, people that don't understand what it's like to go through an autistic meltdown could have a chance to see. Jordan and I have always said, yeah, we'd love to fly somewhere, but we don't know if we could ever get Lincoln on a plane. But now we know we can. Man, he loved it. He, was, he got the window seat. He was propped up. I got pictures. He's propped up, got his legs crossed, hand on the back of the head, looking out the window. And then when it starts moving, the airport starts going, he started out loud counting the windows in the plane. I mean, we had a good time, but can I tell you this? We would not have known had they not been willing to be mobile. Anybody can bring you into a class and try to teach you what it's like to get on an airplane, but there's nothing like actually getting on the airplane. I'm thankful that Delta went mobile because you know what they did? With their mobility, they mobilized us. And so now, if we had that opportunity, now if it arose, guess what? We know, we know, hey, these are areas that we got to, you know, if we're standing in line, sitting in a waiting room, we're going to have to have something for Lincoln to do. But once we get on that airplane, he is good. And he is ready. He loves being in a seatbelt. Didn't think he'd do that. He loves being sitting in a plane. He didn't have to be held. Not once did he try to get in our laps. How do we know? Because they were willing to go. How will the world know what they're capable of until the church is willing to go to the world and show them what they can do in Jesus? If we're healthy, we're going. We're mobile. And the more mobile we become, the more able we become. Number four. A sign of growth is ability. Once you realize you're mobile, you realize you can do more things than you did before. Now, now how many of you today would say, I am literally in my life physically, spiritually, through work or something, doing things that I never dreamed I would do? How many of you not only have one kid, but you have like three or four? And you're like, didn't think I'd survive it. How many of you got two? And you're saying, hey, the second one went nothing like the first one, right? Either the first one was crazy and the second one came in so soft and, you know, silent night, holy night, all right? Or the first one was all went to bed like they should and then all of a sudden the second one came in and it was like Cain and Abel, all right? You know what I mean? One's holding on. It's like Jacob and Esau, all right? One's mischievous and one's loving and kind. Now, please don't tell your kids which is which, all right? But how many of you have ever volunteered for a children's ministry, scared to death, walk in and realize, hey, I absolutely love these kids? How many of you have ever stepped out and said, you know what, I really don't, I had a lady sit in my office, she goes, I'm not really well spoken, but let me tell you your story. 20 minutes later, I'm captivated as she's continuing to tell her story. And at the end of it, I said, you lied to me. You lied to me. You said you weren't a good speaker. And yet here I am, and all I'm thinking is, tell me more. You say, what happens? You, when you realize that you can get mobile, you realize that you can get able to do things that you never thought could be done. Look at this verse, if you would, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. Some of us need to understand and underline. This is the most powerful verse for some of you today because of the next five words. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Let me solve most of your marriage troubles. Let me solve most of your financial troubles. Let me solve most of your coworker problems. Grow up. Stop thinking and reasoning and acting like children. Grow up. All right, now, how many of you understand that when a baby's born, it coos? You know what I mean by cooing? It sounds like a little pigeon. Like, ooh. The first laugh, you remember the first laugh of your child? You're sitting there and you're trying to do everything. It doesn't matter what it takes. You're going to do everything you can to make that kid laugh again. It becomes a beautiful sound, a symphony in your mind. Then all of a sudden, cooing starts going into sounds. 
Cooing turns to mooing. Now they're walking around every time they see a cow. Moo. How many of you remember this? Others, you're teaching them. The chicken says, bah, bah. I mean, you're doing everything. You're teaching them sounds. It turns into babble. And all of a sudden, your kid comes up to you speaking in tongues. Yeah. You have no clue what they're saying. And then babble actually turns into spoken words. And words turn into sentences. And sentences turn into conversation. Now, before you take that for granted and say, yeah, one day you'll wish they'd shut up, I wish mine would start talking. So please do not take for granted the gift you have of being able to converse with your children. But as they begin to develop that ability, they begin to develop a lot more things. Now that they can have a conversation, they can be taught so much more. And as they're conversing, well, why? Well, that's just the way light switches work. Well, why? Well, the power company brings a, an electric thing to the house, and then the electric goes into the breaker box, and the breaker box switches on, and that breaker sends an electrical current to the... I mean, you've been explaining everything, and you get to where you think you have just explained it better than an encyclopedia, which some people don't know what that is because it's not in, in existence much anymore, but you, 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 you've explained it to the detail, and you're, you're standing there, a proud parent, saying, I have conquered reasoning in their mind, and then after you get the whole explanation, you're like, but Why? And then you finally say, go ask your dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go ask somebody else. But what happens? Their mind begins to develop. Their abilities begin to grow. Oh, now I'm not just standing. I'm jumping. Oh, I kind of like jumping. Oh, now I can swing. Oh, push me. Oh, I kick my legs and I can do it on my own. Get out of the way. You only push me so high. I want to go higher. Ooh, good, good. Hey, listen, we need to, as a church, get the people on the swings and then get out of the way. You know what? The church stands in the way and says, nope, this is as high as you can go. Stay here. This is where I'm comfortable because I can control you. I can understand you. I said the church, let's talk about spouse relationships. This is what I want you to be. I'm safe when you're here. You know, the best thing you can do for somebody in your life is get out of the way and let them see how able they can be. Yeah. Scariest thing for a parent, right? On the swings. Kid starts kicking. Swing set starts rocking. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're looking, that post just came out of the air. That post just came out of the air. That post just came out of the air. And then you make the mistake. You look at them and say, you're going too high. And what they heard is, oh, I can fly. All right? And so they, they get that peak. And what do they do? They let go. And there they are springing out. And they land. And you're thinking, I'm going to Lacan. I'm going to the medical center. I'm going to Jeff Memorial. And all of a sudden, they start laughing and rolling and get back up. And what do they do? And what do they do when they get back on the swings? They go higher. I mean, they see, hey, what would happen if as believers we didn't just get them to Christ, we got them through Christ, and we started pushing them, and all of a sudden we showed them, you can kick your own legs, you can get this going, you can stand in your own faith, and one day they say, get away, and let me soar, and we see them doing things for God that are greater than we could do. See, health says this, oh, I'm healthy, I'm growing, I'm getting stronger immunity-wise, and oh, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm getting an appetite that I didn't used to have, and now I'm hungry, and my muscles are developing, and I'm getting stronger spiritually. Hey, I'm mobile, now I can do things. Hey, not only am I mobile, I'm able, and I can do all things through Christ, not through Grace Community Church, not through Pastor Josh Moore, not through a podcast, not through Steve Furrick, not through Rick Warren, not through Celebrate Recovery, not through one. 80, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Hey, you are not growing as a Christian if the only time you're showing your Christianity is when you're with other Christians. You're growing as a Christian when you're a Christian when no one else is around. Let your light shine so that they can see your good works. See, when I become able, I become available. Oh, Pastor Josh, sign me up. I want to go. Oh, Mobile Life House, October 27th, I'm there. New adults on Friday night, I'm going, I'm growing. Hey, a life group, I'm in it. Oh, Nerf Wars, with a bunch of kids who may not have fathers present. Most will have fathers present, some won't. Well, that's below me. It might be below you, but it's above them. So reach down from your little pedestal and raise somebody else up. 
You'll find that as you reach down from your pedestal to lift somebody up, they'll pull you off your pedestal. That's the best place you can be. And as you're standing, they begin standing. Hey, but I'm learning this. Most times I have to fall before I stand. I have to crawl before I walk. But the more able I become, the more available I can be. So I close with this. I get this a lot. Well, I just want to hear God speak, and I wish God would give me a sign. Oh, you know what? You know what? Can I tell you this? Why would God say anything else to you or show you anything else until you stopped I started listening to what he's already said and already looked at what he's already done. We have too many people saying, well, I just don't know if God's real, so I'm going to sit here and wait on it. I don't hear God. There's a big book called the Bible where God has said a lot. You say, well, I need God to call me to do something incredible. You know what the first thing God calls you to? I'm going to give it to you. Ready? Obedience. You say, yeah. No, he calls me to salvation. You don't have salvation without obedience. Obe- salvation says, I want you to give a Savior your heart, confess him as Lord. A Savior, you didn't live during his lifetime. You weren't at the cross. You didn't walk into the empty grave, but I want you to believe it. Okay, God, I believe. That's obedience. You say it starts with belief. It starts with obedience. There is no belief without obedience. You say, well, what do I believe God can do? You're not going to get much more belief than you've had faithfulness. God is the rewarder of those who diligently what? Seek him. And we're raising a generation of believers that says, well, I want to experience God. Then you better obey him. You say, why? Because obedience grows my abilities. Now, if you have the teenager that always listens, the teenager that always shows up on time, the teenager that always does their chores, you're more than likely going to allow them to do more than the teenager that never shows up on time, never does their chores, and never follows through. Are you with me? As a pastor, I refuse to raise people up who are not willing to get up on their own. You say, well, what do you mean? If they say they're going to be somewhere and they don't show up, they're not going to get the position. You say, why? Because they're not able. Well, why are they not able? Because they're not obedient. You say, obedient to you? No. Obedient to God. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You lose all credibility when your yes is your no and your no is your yes. Nobody cares what you have to say. And today we have all these Christians that are saying, listen to me. No, 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 no. We need Christians that say, follow. One of the greatest sermons Jesus preached was to an audience of one. Luke 5, they get back to the shore. Peter's standing there with all these fish. And he looks at Peter and he says, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. And what happened, the Bible says, and Peter dropped his nets. Are you a follow me believer? You know what that is? That's a healthy believer. How do I know if I'm healthy? How do I know if I'm growing? I'm healthy, all right? I'm getting stronger. Number two, I got an appetite for the Lord. Number three, I'm getting mobile, and I'm getting more mobile. Number four, I'm able, which has made me available. And when God says, cast down your net, if you say so, God, I will drop my net again. But you don't understand how hard it's been. Oh, that's what Peter said. I have toiled all night long and come up with nothing, but if you say so, I'll do it again. You're just a carpenter. I mean, you came from a carpenter's kid. I'm a fisher. You don't know, this isn't your profession, dude. I let you use my boat to preach, and now you're telling me how to run my boat? Now I've worked all night. I just cleaned my nets. My nets are clean. In other words, I I just worked hard after I worked hard. I'm discouraged. I'm tired. I haven't caught a thing, and you just know how to build a table, but you're going to tell me how to fish? Okay. You say so. I'll do it. You know what that is? Availability. And the more able I become, the more available I become. And the more available I become, the more able I become. God will not give you more today if you've not done anything with what he gave you yesterday. God will not bless you with one ounce more if you haven't already used the ounces he's given you. You Say, well, I want the pounds. You better use the ounces. Well, I want the ounce. Oh, well, you better use the gram. Well, I want the gram. You better use the milligram. You say, well, God hasn't given me anything. There's breath in your body. What are you doing with it? Well, God, God, God's never been there for me. Are you kidding? You're born in America, the richest country in the nation. You're in the top 10% of the richest people in the world. 
You have more at your fingertips than most people in the world have ever seen in their lives. You step into a shower every single day that people would have no idea what to do with if they were faced with it because they've never had warm water ever touch their body. You go to your fountain, you go to your fridge, and you stick a cup up to a water spout where most people have to take a two-day journey just to get something worth drinking. And then after they get it, they got to purify it. You have no idea what God has given you. And I'm going to guarantee you this. You have no right to ask him for any more if you're not using what you've already got. I want to grow and I want to go. So God, you've made me able, so I am available. And as you step into availability, God gives you more abilities. You say, well, I was born with every ability. Yeah, okay, physically. But don't you realize that a spiritual birth happened to you too when you became a Christian? You were born again. And when you were born again, you got to see things you normally can't see. You're able to do things you normally can't do. There's something about what the Holy Spirit brings into your life that you can't match. And that is why God sent the Holy Spirit, to raise you up. So are you growing? Or do you need to hear the basics again? Do you need to hear the fundamentals again? Because if so, you're stagnant. And the more you stand stagnant, the more you stink. I'll close with the story we're out. About a month ago, we played in the backyard with swimming pools about six weeks ago. And time got away from me, and I didn't drain the pools. Now, when I say swimming pools, we're talking kiddie pools. They don't have filters. You fill the water up, you drain the water. That's how it goes. If you leave the water, the water grows. Matter of fact, let's just pause here and say this. One way or the other, you're growing. Either you're growing to be healthier or you're growing diseased. So as the water began to grow, a frog got in there and started croaking. In other words, he was saying, Ladies, I've got two houses. Come check me out. We had two little kitty pools set up side by side. Next thing you know, we got tadpoles. My wife decides to let them live so that we can observe the scientific process as things begin to generate and legs begin to grow. And in one of the pools, we had tadpoles growing around, and now we are all invested. There's life in the pools. One of the other pools had mature frogs that had uh, tadpoles that had actually started growing their legs and different things like that. And so we just let it sit so that we could watch these things grow. Problem, problem, algae began to grow. It rained. It stormed. I mowed grass, and things blew into the water. And that water, because it could not move, and that water, because it was not stirred, began to get stale. And eventually, one night, I walked out on our back porch and got met with the stench of lethargic, stagnant water. And I looked at Jordan, and I said, we got to get rid of this. So we went to the pools, and we realized that in one pool, it's as if they had stopped growing. But in the pool that was the cleanest... They had grown to full term and had jumped out, and none were remaining. And as we drained that pool, I realized there was a difference in the two pools, and here's the difference. The pool on the right had more of a slope, and when it would rain, it would filter out. But the pool on the left was sitting in the most level spot, and when it rained, it would fill up and maybe some trickle out, but it never cycled through. Now listen to me. You want your areas of life to grow, then let the water flow. Yes, sir. Let God flow through you. And as you're being cleaned and as you're being renewed, you'll start sprouting some legs. And one day, instead of being the thing that swims, you'll be the thing that hops. Instead of being something that's dependent on something falling in to feed you, you'll be the one being able to go out there and seek food. Listen to me. I want Grace Community Church to be a church that says, we're done preaching the basics again and again and again. Now, are we going to bring people to Jesus Christ? Yes. But isn't it time to learn what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are actually all? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it time to learn what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in our lives and actually start to trust Him? Isn't it time to learn what God says about sex? Isn't it time to learn what, what God says about divorce? You say, well, oh, these make me uncomfortable. Exactly. Why? Because you're used to the basics. And let me tell you, the basics will only take you so far. And I want to go deeper. I want to go further. So I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I want to ask you this question. 
Are you willing to grow? Are you willing to let God grow you and develop you? Are you willing to allow God to do in your life today what he wants to do? Are you healthy? Are you getting stronger? Do you have an appetite? Do you crave the Lord? Oh, man, are you mobile? Are you out there serving the Lord? Use those abilities to reach others with the gospel. So today it comes down to one simple prayer. God, take me further. Take me deeper. I want more of you, God. I want more. And if that is your heart's desire, would you lift a hand and a prayer to heaven and say, God, take me deeper. Take me deeper. Amen. Stand with me. Let's grab somebody's hand. We're going to say goodbye to online. Hey, I'm glad you, you are here today. Aren't you glad?